Well, um, on behalf of my tech, the MIT Activities, I want to welcome everybody to the, uh, the joys of home brewing today with uh, Jeffrey Gottschalk from Lincoln Laboratory, um, who will explain some of the intricacies and joys and some of the basics of home brewing um, and how to make a really great beer. So um, I will let uh, Jeffrey take it away. So let us let us enjoy the joys of home brewing. <laughs> all right, thanks thanks so much, and uh, uh, thanks all for attending and being interested uh, in this. So hopefully, if I do this right, you will be able to see this. Post this disabled screen sharing. When I try to share, it says you have disabled screen sharing. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> Try it one more time. All right. This looks a lot more promising. Beautiful. All right. And hopefully when I go to screen share, or I'm sorry, presentation mode. Now, are you seeing it in presentation mode? Is that correct? We are seeing it in presentation okay. mode, which is not ideal. <laughs> Oh, I see. You see it. You see it in we the. Um, you see the one with like the upcoming slides and everything. Yeah, we do. Okay, let me, let me, we know how to fix that. How about that? Is that better? That's perfect. Excellent. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, uh, uh, welcome. I thought I'd start off just to give a little bit of my own personal history at MIT. I, I was hired in '96 um, by uh, uh, now Professor Vincent Chan uh, when he worked at Lincoln Lab. Um, I had some collaborations with campus uh, over the past several years, some which I've funded research on campus and uh, one where I'm collaborating right uh, right now with uh, Professor Warnell and Poyansky uh, on a cool AI project. Uh, and I've also served on the uh, uh, selection committee for the MIT Excellence Awards for a couple of years. And so through that, I've actually gotten to know a lot about different departments and, and things like that and, and people, really cool and interesting people uh, at MIT. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I've done a bunch of different things at Lincoln Lab, but uh, what I've done most recently is uh, uh, head a group, a uh, research group out there called Cyber Physical Systems. You can see the great people in my group there, uh, and a URL if you want to learn more about the research group. But on to the good stuff, uh, uh, which is beer. Uh, I will uh, say that uh, this uh, talk does have uh, images that I've grabbed off the web and things like that, so uh, uh, please be aware of that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, opinions are my own. Uh, and you'll see this logo for Gottschalk Brewing Company. Uh, if I have time, I'll tell you more about where that came from, but it's completely fictional. There is no Gottschalk Brewing Company. Uh, so why is home brewing, uh, you know, a cool hobby? Uh, well, basically, if you can cook food, uh, you can make good uh, homebrew. Um, and uh, the more practice you have, the better it get. The better you get at it, the better the beer. Um, the ingredients are uh, pretty all natural. Uh, there's no preservatives or artificial ingredients in it. Uh, and because beer is carbonated, you can keep it uh, a pretty long time if you treat it well. Um, the, the, the next bullet about uh, home brewing can make you effective, more effective socially is a bit of a joke. Uh, but the point is, is that beer, like food, is a really interesting part of, of various cultures uh, around the world. Um, and uh, how it's made uh, is really interesting too. And, you know, People love uh, to talk about beers they like, and, and, and some of them like to talk about how it's made. Usually, uh, beer people are, are good to talk to, um, so, so it can be uh, fun that way. And uh, as we'll talk about coming up next, um, it can actually be uh, reasonably cost effective. Um, so uh, these days, most craft beer that you go to a store and buy uh, comes in a 16-ounce can. And that can range from anywhere from about, you know, uh, upper end of $3 to, to almost $6 a can. Uh, and some are even more than that. Um, you know, if you get it in a keg, it can be a little bit cheaper, but of course you've got to rent the keg and you got to have the stuff to serve it out of and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but homebrew is a lot cheaper in my opinion. Uh, of course, uh, the costs that I'm going to put down uh, that I reference here don't cite the cost of the equipment, but uh, basically, you know, most beer styles cost about 34 30 to 40 dollars in ingredients to make a five gallon batch and you can go to lots of different places uh, to get that either at a local uh, homebrew shop or online there's a variety of different uh, places and you can make pretty good beer out of that stuff um, the higher the alcohol in a beer it means the more ingredients went into that beer so that you could have that more alcohol in it and so that runs a little bit more maybe like 50 60 bucks uh, and if you uh, make one that's particularly hoppy there's we'll talk a little bit about different hop varieties some of them are uh, 
expensive, more expensive than others. Uh, and so the most expensive beer that I make is uh, this New England double IPA style, which runs about 95 bucks. Although if I wanted to cut corners a little bit, I could probably get that down to about 85 bucks for a five gallon batch. Um, so the table below just shows um, some uh, typical costs uh, for commercial beers uh, that a lot of, you know, you, you typically find in a, in a beer store, uh, as well as uh, some that are a little more expensive and uh, are at, at, you know, at New England area uh, craft beer places that don't sell in beer stores like Treehouse. Uh, and I've just tried to uh, compare some of those prices. And so the one I'll uh, point out here is uh, uh, this Treehouse uh, uh, Haze Double IPA. You know, this is sort of like a really hip, cool beer that people like, and it's delicious. Um, my uh, Double IPA, and so, some people have compared favorably to it, but it, co it cost me about half of what it costs to go buy a can of one of these things. I can make a, a bunch of this. So that's pretty neat. Some recent trends, uh, you know, coronavirus uh, has really impacted a lot of uh, economy and industry and craft beer has been one of them. Um, in some cases, it's cost them, caused them to do some really interesting things like uh, offer uh, curbside beer pickup or even delivery like night shift uh, brewing and Trillium will uh, deliver to some areas in the Boston area. Uh, but some of these craft breweries that have really uh, ex uh, exploded and, and, and become, uh, uh, you know, lot, lots of different ones in the area, a lot of them uh, may not make it uh, through this uh, difficult time. So that's kind of why there was a, this news article about maybe now is a good time to start home brewing. Here's what I'd like you to take away from the talk how beer works and the different styles, uh, basic different styles of beer out there. Because if you're going to make it, you should understand how it works. Um, and, uh, you know, then we'll talk about the basics of making home, uh, homebrew beer uh, and what I call well-optimized for quality and effort. So my own personal philosophy is if I'm going to have, a, if I'm going to buy some equipment and I'm going to spend the time making it, uh, I'd really like the beer to taste good. It should be, it should taste it, it'd be something that I'd willing, be willing to pay money for. In other words, it should be an alternative to going to the store to buy something. I should be able to have a beer that I made myself that I go, yeah, that's pretty good. I, you know, I, I enjoy that. And I don't want to do it in a way that just takes a lot of time or requires a lot of stuff or equipment. Uh, and so, cause I'm kind of lazy that way. Um, so uh, a lot of the, um, the thought process uh, and the brewing style that I'll show you today is, is arranged uh, around that sort of uh, guiding principle. And the other part is, is that uh, uh, the, the graphics in this are designed as sort of a visual guidebook for this. So if you want to come back and look at it later on, uh, you can actually sort of follow some of the diagrams uh, as, as they go along. Um, as far as my own personal background with beer, um, you know, probably the first time I homebrewed was in 94 with some, some buddies in grad school. Uh, but I got my own uh, equipment uh, when I was living in an apartment building, you know, short, you know when I started working at, at Lincoln Lab. Uh, and I, it turned out I ended up getting involved in a couple of area homebrew clubs. There's the Boston uh, Wurtz. Uh, and then uh, there was another uh, club in southern New Hampshire called uh, Brew Fear Die that's still around that I was part of. And, you know, they would occasionally run homebrew competitions. I would enter my homebrew into that. I would get judged. I would say, hmm, why, did, why didn't I win? And I'd get some feedback from a judge. And through that, I got really interested in beer judging. Uh, and so I learned about beer styles, how to judge beer. And at one point, I was actually uh, the competition coordinator for the Brew Fear Die Club. So I got to taste a lot of people's different beers, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and learn a little bit about what works and what doesn't work in beer. Um, another hobby of mine is, is beer tourism and going to craft beer fest, mostly to try different cool beers, uh, as well as to go places uh, and see where it's made in situ in their industrial processes and things like that. And there's a sampling of a couple of different um, places I've been. Luckily, my wife uh, in the red uh, in the lower right corner is a good sport and doesn't mind going to these places with me. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a 101 on what uh, beer is and how it works. So for millennia, people have been making beer uh, and they knew that it had water in it and that it had grain in it. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe they added some things that were uh, a bittering agent or a preservative agent like hops or pine needles or heather or other things uh, that uh, fulfill the role of hops in beer. Uh, and then in many cases, there was this something else. They weren't really sure what it was, they could see it, but uh, it turns out we, you know, we know it's yeast now, but, but back, way back when they didn't know what that was, it was kind of like magic to them. And you let that stuff hang out for a while and you get, you get beer. Today, we know that process uh, 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 to have a, a you know, nice uh, definable uh, process to it. I borrowed this graphic from Elevation Beer Company 
Um, but basically you start with uh, different types of grains that have been prepared in different ways. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between base grain and specialty grain coming up. Those uh, grains are cracked or milled, uh, and the milled grain is then passed into a big uh, uh, vessel uh, for mashing, and water is added to it and heated up. Think of this as like making oatmeal. Uh, and then after uh, the oatmeal is sort of done cooking, what happens is the liquid with all the sort of good ingredients uh, that uh, have been uh, now put into solution uh, in that uh, mashing process are extracted out. And, th and that, that liquid is called wort. Uh, and then the remaining uh, uh, grains uh, can be used for compost or you know, feeding animals, that sort of thing. The wort is pumped into a brew kettle and it's boiled. And at different points in the boil, hops are added. Uh, usually at this point when you are adding hops into the boil, you're doing it to add bitterness uh, to the beer uh, and get those good preservatives uh, going uh, in the beer. Uh, it's aerated in a whirlpool and then uh, pumped through a heat exchanger and cooled so that uh, it's uh, to a lower temperature where yeast can be added to it and then additional hops and or spices can be added for flavor and different types of aromas uh, where it then ferments for a while. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, pumped out. Uh, typically, uh, some, some beer types are, are filtered, so they filter out the yeast that's still in the beer. Um, some are uh, left cloudy with the, with the beer in it. Uh, those go into a tank where uh, that they're, uh, they naturally uh, carbonate, or maybe they force carbonate it with CO2 by pumping it in there. Uh, and then it goes off for packaging, either in bottles or cans or kegs, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you've heard of beers that have been barrel aged, uh, they tend to be, uh, there's an interstitial uh, step at the bottom there called barrel aging uh, before it's ready to be carbonated. So that's the basic processes uh, uh, for brewing. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the ingredients a little bit more and then come back uh, to this brewing process when we uh, get into sort of the virtual brew day. Um, uh, one thing I will point out that um, for this talk, uh, we're gonna do a type of brewing called uh, uh, extract brewing. So rather than doing all grain brewing, which is what's shown here, where you go all the way from the base grains, add the specialty grains and go from there, uh, we're gonna use a substitute for the base grains called malt extract. And I'll show you what that looks like on the next uh, picture. Malted grains are the base grains uh, for the beer. Uh, what is malting? Well, uh, uh, grains are malted by moistening them until they sort of sprout a little bit uh, and then they're kiln dried. Uh, kiln dried. Uh, what that allows uh, to do is that uh, there's some starch conversion to sugar uh, in, in the, in the uh, grain and there's some additional enzymes uh, that are produced. Most beer that you make uh, or drink uh, is made out of uh, barley, uh, uh, but there are, um, other grains that can be used. Uh, we'll talk about those in a second. The amount of fermentable sugar that uh, ends up in the beer wort can be measured with a device called a hydrometer, and I'll show you what that is later on too. If you use malt extract, that lets you skip the step of mashing uh, the base grains uh, and can save a little bit of time uh, and can be easier to deal with from a process uh, perspective. So really you don't need that, mash, that mashing uh, step at all. You can go right to the boiling part. And uh, uh, extract comes in uh, different types of configurations. It can come in a dry uh, uh, configuration that almost looks like flour, uh, although it's very sticky. Uh, or it comes in a liquid syrup and it kind of looks like thick maple syrup or Cairo syrup or something like that. Uh, that you can add in uh, to the water. Specialty grains are usually added uh, to uh, your beer uh, and they are uh, uh, kilned at different levels of darkness, kind of like coffee beans are. Uh, and they give different colors and flavors to beer. Um, they can give caramelly notes, they can give uh, burnt or acidic notes uh, or charred uh, notes, uh, depending on what it is you want. And some specialty items aren't even uh, really uh, barley malt. They can be flaked grains like oats, uh, or even spices like cardamoms uh, or uh, sugars. Uh, uh, a lot of Belgian beers uh, add candy sugar, basically rock candy, uh, into the beer. And there's a picture down below of sort of uh, a couple of different types of grains uh, and sort of you can see almost that sort of coffee bean roasting. You know, you might have a light roast or a dark roast uh, aspect to this. Hops are another really important uh, ingredient. Um, uh, hops are flowers uh, that grow on a vine. 
Um, you can brew with the flowers, but most people, uh, and uh, what I use is uh, uh, flowers that have sort of been macerated and put into these little things called pellets. Uh, and so the pellets are just uh, really concentrated uh, hop flour uh, pieces that have been mashed up uh, in an easy to use uh, uh, format. There's lots of different types of hop varieties, um, just like there are tea. So if malts, uh, we use the coffee analogy here with the hops, we can use sort of a tea analogy. Um, and there's a lot of different um, hop varieties that are shown on the right. This is just a subset of them, uh, but you can see that they have different uh, properties to them uh, in terms of aroma and flavor. Um, some of them are spicy, some are fruity, some are citrusy, some of them are herbal and that sort of thing. And then uh, what you see in different, uh, inside the, that circle are different names of hop varieties like Pacifica, Challenger, uh, Willamette, that sort of thing. What's really cool is that, uh, like many things, they uh, become really popular. You know, uh, uh, you get people uh, sort of experimenting with new things. Um, and so, in 1984, uh, there was this book uh, that was very, you know, seminal for the home brewing uh, 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 hobbyist out there called "The Joy of Home Brewing" by Charlie Papazian. It, he only listed 46 hop varieties, which was still a lot. But by 2019, there were over 147 different hop varieties listed. In some cases. They're the same base hop, they're just grown in different regions of the world. And so almost like wine uh, uh, gives uh, different types of terroir uh, to the grapes, uh, depending on where it's grown and the soil and the conditions, the same is true for hops. So you could take the same basic genetic material, grow it in one place, grow it in a different place, and you can get some slightly different characteristics out of that. Um, from a technical level, um, uh, I show just sort of cartoons of some of the uh, chemical uh, compounds that are important in hops. There are uh, these things called alpha acids, which uh, are what import the bitterness to beer. Uh, and then there are beta acids and other compounds that give different types of flavors and aroma. And they're both really important. Uh, and different hop varieties have differing amounts of these acids. Um, the important thing to remember with um, hops is a lot of people will taste a beer and describe it as hoppy, as in, ooh, that's hoppy, I like it, or ooh, that's too hoppy for me. Uh, taste is in the mouth of the imbiber on this one, okay? You can have a beer that you perceive as hoppy, even if it's a very light beer that hardly has any hops in it at all, um, like uh, German lagers, pilsners, uh, British uh, ESBs, or extra special bitters. Um, they're fairly light-bodied beers. There's not a, you know, there's not a lot uh, to them in terms of malt. They're low alcohol, uh, and they don't have a lot of hops in them, but you perceive the hops in it in comparison to the other thing. Some beers are really fruity and citrusy uh, because they've had a lot of hops added, uh, what's called dry hopping, at, at, uh, right before they're, they're served, really. Uh, but, they, they're, but they're not actually that bitter. So New England IPAs would be an example of one of those. And then there are other ones that are extremely bitter, very piney and resiny with a lot of herbal notes. Uh, and those because they boiled the hops a long time to get a lot of that extraction of those alpha acids into the bitterness. Um, so those are all things that one might perceive in a beer or different types of beers uh, as hoppy, but they're, but they're actually different uh, experiences. Yeast is sort of the alchemical, if you will, ingredient to beer. Uh, and uh, it's what really transforms the beer into starches and sugars and enzymes and proteins and water into beer. Um, uh, because, you know, the yeast is alive. It actually does things. There are lots of different uh, makers out there that you can buy these days uh, for uh, brewing uh, beer with. Uh, I list a couple of the popular ones here. Um, typically, uh, brewing yeast uh, can come in dry packets, just like baker's yeast. Uh, but it can also come in liquid yeast packets. And so to show you what one of those looks like, uh, that's here on the right. Um, this is uh, something that, you know, you would keep in a refrigerator until you're uh, ready to use it. Uh, you cut off the top and inside is basically this yeast and liquid mixture, which you then pour into your beer when you're ready to uh, ferment it. And the one I'm showing, the particular strain, California Ale Yeast, uh, White Labs and Y Yeast both offer this uh, uh, ale uh, yeast uh, strain. That's a very popular, uh, that's used to make a lot of different commercial beers out there. Um, if you had to pick one yeast strain that most beer is made out of, uh, uh, particularly if it's an ale, this is it. Um, uh, and it's very versatile. So when you're brewing and you put your yeast in the beer, 
uh, in the wort uh, to, so that it will make beer, your objective is to establish a healthy yeast colony. You want the good microorganisms to establish and the bad microorganisms to not ever get established in your beer. And the reason why is those uh, uh, other microorganisms uh, are contaminants, they can lead to off flavors, um, and uh, yeah, you, you typically don't want them unless it's a, a strange style beer, which, which we'll also talk about. So the way to do uh, this is uh, really establish a strong yeast colony very early on. There's a couple of ways to do it. You can either uh, take some yeast uh, from one of these packets and a couple of days before brewing, uh, you can make a yeast starter, which is really just making, taking a little bit of that uh, malt extract and water, boiling it for 15 minutes and adding your yeast packet into it. Uh, but you're making a bigger, you know, maybe 16 ounces of that. And so at, over a day or so that you now have, almost like you were making a sourdough starter, you've now got 16 ounces of this uh, yeast slurry instead of a small packet of it uh, that you can use. Um, the other way to do it is just buy two packets of yeast uh, and, uh, uh, and use that in a five gallon batch of beer and that will get uh, fermenting uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and I'll show you examples of, of those uh, timelines later on. I've mentioned a couple of different types of beer styles uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. So this is my attempt at putting together a, a description of what all those different styles are. There are two main types of beers categories really driven by types of yeast. Uh, there are ales, all made with ale yeast, and there are lagers, all made with lager yeast. The big difference between those two is listed at the bottom of this uh, picture. Uh, ale yeasts uh, ferment at the top of the wort. They, live, they tend to live and do their job at the top, and they typically ferment in about three to five weeks at about 60 to 75 degrees. Lagers uh, ferment at the bottom uh, of the liquid, and they ferment over a longer time frame, and they're typically fermented at a cool, they like to, they, they, you know, they procreate and, and, and grow uh, at, lower, at lower temperatures, so uh, more like 45, 55. So for this, you typically want to brew when it's cooler uh, in the fall or something like that, or you want a place where you can actually uh, have a temperature controlled environment and, and cool, cool the beer down. Uh, over a long period of time. There are a lot of different interesting styles out there um, and I could give a whole talk just on these styles. Um, so I'll try not to do that here so we can actually have time to talk about how to build different types of recipes uh, and how to brew beer. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on a few. Uh, India Pale Ale um, is a really popular style that's out there uh, these days. A lot of people here have heard of the IPA. And more recently, you know, there's a lot of subcategories of IPA that are out there. You'll hear things like milkshake IPAs, and grapefruit IPAs, and all sorts of interesting uh, things. But, but back in the day, you know, in the 1800s, there was just English IPA. And that actually was a subcategory of pale ale up here in the upper left-hand side. Uh, it was a, sub, a special category of, of English pale ale. And over the years, it's kind of taken on its own sort of life and its own category, just like stout actually started life as a special type of porter, uh, but has since broken out into a very own, its own unique set of styles and, uh, and different types of descriptions uh, there. Um, some of these are uh, uh, wheat beers where uh, instead of barley malt, uh, barley uh, all being mostly almost 90% to 100% barley malt, uh, wheat beers uh, typically are something like 30% to 50% uh, wheat malt. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is very popular in Europe, uh, European styles of beer. Uh, and then there are some called Lambic and Sour, where uh, they are ale yeast, but they have weird things in them. They have other microorganisms in them uh, that are uh, uh, naturally occurring uh, in uh, the air uh, in, in Europe uh, and are part of it. So they're, they're wild yeasts, basically. So there's some other things that, uh, that make them kind of interesting. And those beers tend to have a little bit of a lactic or a sour taste to them. They're very interesting. Uh, uh, lagers, Jeffrey, yeah. real quick question from the chat. Can you yes. malt wheat and barley together or do they need to be malted separately? Sure. Um, producers of, uh, typically as a home brewer, what you're going to do is buy grains that have already been malted. Okay. Um, and so uh, a producer will have malted them. And yes, you, you will buy wheat malt or barley malt, depending on what it is you want to buy uh, uh, to make your, your beer out of. 
as far as when you brew uh, with that, uh, yeah, you can put them all together. It's not a problem. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, in terms of lagers, um, you know, a good example, you know, Bud Light, Budweiser, those sorts of things, they're sort of the good example of an American lager uh, uh, or American light lager. So that's in the pale lager category. Uh, but there are a lot of other really interesting uh, uh, dark lagers, uh, you know, Box, uh, Doppelbox, uh, Schwarzbeers, and, and all sorts of other interesting things that are out there um, that have some of the same properties as ales, uh, but they're just uh, lager, uh, uh, lager yeast. And so they have uh, some different flavor profiles that the lager yeast imparts upon them. And then there's a couple of uh, uh, beer styles that are um, called hybrid styles because um, they're either uh, ale style beers that have been made with a lager yeast or a lager style beer that's been made with an ale yeast. And so if you've ever heard of Anchor Steam Beer, that's an example of one of these hybrid styles. Okay, so let's talk about calculating uh, how much alcohol by volume there is in the beer and uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, when, once you have it, okay. It's calculated from specific gravity readings of the beer when you, uh, and that's done with a hydrometer. Uh, I show a picture of one and a, a close-up of a scale on a, on a brewer's hydrometer uh, uh, down below. The, the hydrometer measures the relative density of the liquid. So the idea here is, is that uh, um, the gravity is highest uh, when, when before fermentation starts because that's when the wort has the most sugar in it. So uh, the hydrometer doesn't go down into it as far. Uh, there's more, you know, more density and more resistance against it. So you get one reading. Uh, and then later after the beer is uh, fermented well and you, uh, you know, have alcohol in the beer, uh, there's less sugars in the beer because they've been turned into alcohol. So the hydrometer sinks in further and you can take a reading uh, off of that of where, where it's uh, sticking out of the liquid. And um, you can find a table, look up tables for this uh, on the web, uh, and you can use brewer calculators that will make these calculations for you. I'm representing just a subset of uh, different uh, uh, measurements here just to, to give you an idea of how this works uh, in this lookup table. So across the top, there are the original gravity readings that you would take before you start, uh, put the yeast in and start fermentation. And along the column side are the final gravity readings that you would take uh, when, you're, when you feel fermentation is done uh, and you're ready to uh, uh, package uh, your beer. Um, so for example, if you started off with a beer that had a, a 1.050 or 1050 original gravity, and it had a finishing gravity of 1010, you would uh, have a beer with about 5% alcohol. In it. Likewise, if you had started off with only a 1040, Alcohol, uh, uh, original gravity, but a 10-10 finishing gravity, you'd have a lower alcohol beer, more like 3.8%. And then likewise, if you go to the right, uh, you know, you result in, in, in higher uh, alcohol content, uh, 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 depending on what that is. But again, there's a bit of a diagonal that runs here too, uh, where you can see even if you start with a 1050 and add with, end with a 1010, that's 5.1, you can get pretty close to that if you start at 1060 and end at 1016. So it's sort of a graduated scale that goes with this. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, recipes. And I, and I will caveat up front, none of the recipes you're about to see are my recipes. Uh, these are all uh, things that I found in a database uh, online and, I, and, I'm use, and, and I'm using, and nor have I brewed these beers. Uh, I'm just really using them to uh, show you the difference about uh, what goes into uh, ingredients uh, in, a, in a particular type of beer and how that affects uh, what some of the measurements uh, that you would be making about that beer as you're brewing. So uh, what I have here is a screenshot of uh, a, a beer, a home brewing calculator called uh, Brewer's Friend. Um, there's a lot of different ones out there. I've used you know, many of them. I don't have a particular preference. It's just one that you can find uh, online and that I'll use uh, in this talk. Um, and here uh, we have a recipe that somebody uh, uh, has brewed and feels like, tastes a lot like Bud Light. I, I have no idea if this is actually true or not. Um, but, uh, but I wanna use it to illustrate a few things uh, and point out some things. 
At the top, there are some overall metrics that we'll look at. There's the original gravity that the calculator uh, will help you uh, uh, calculate. The final gravity that it'll help you calculate, it'll do that conversion of that lookup table for you and say this is probably about a 4.38% alcohol by volume beer. Uh, it'll calculate uh, something called, uh, which is really a, uh, an industry quality control uh, measure called IBUs, which uh, are some indication of how bitter uh, the, hop, uh, the hops uh, have become in, the, in that particular beer. Uh, and it'll also show another thing called SRM, uh, which is really about how, what the color of the beer is likely to be. And as we move through this, you'll see this, uh, it, this calculator is even clever enough to show you different pictures to show you approximately what color the beer would be. So in this, uh, it'll show uh, base grains. Um, this one is using um, a dry malt extract and a particularly light version of that called Pilsen. It's using three pounds of it. Uh, and it's using uh, corn sugar or dextrose as part of the fermentable sugars. So it's got about four pounds of fermentable sugars uh, that it's been put in this. And they've added some specialty grains, a little bit of flaked corn, because if you've ever taken a tour of the Budweiser uh, brewery in, in, in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, they'll tell you that, that they use corn in the brewing process. So this person has said, okay, well, I'll, I'll put some flaked corn in there uh, and some other uh, specialty grains. And then they've put a light amount of hops in, mostly at the boil, which means 60 minutes. They're gonna boil for 60 minutes. Uh, and, uh, and so they're putting a little bit of these uh, Columbus uh, hop pellets uh, in the boil at the beginning. And so this results in a beer with about 4% alcohol, a relatively uh, mild uh, uh, hop bitterness of, of 10, uh, and a very light sort of straw color of two. Let's see how that changes when we uh, move to something else. Again, this is someone else's uh, from online's uh, uh, what they feel like tastes like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, and so uh, here I'll point out uh, some differences. Uh, you know, this beer uh, is going to be golden colored, uh, medium bodied with a, a good amount of hop aroma, uh, hop bitterness and a piney aroma. And you'll see that showing up in the, uh, the, the color, uh, more of a golden color. You'll see that it has more alcohol by volume. Uh, and it had a higher original gravity. And the reason why is instead of about four pounds of fermentable sugars in it, it's got about six pounds of fermentable grains and sugars in it. Uh, and here, uh, they're using a variety of different uh, kinds of those. They're also adding some specialty grains that have a darker color to them, like this American Caramel Crystal 40 Lova Bond. Um, 40 Lova Bond references the color of the, the, uh, the degree of the color of the grain uh, after it's been malted. So it's basically the, the roastedness of that, uh, roasted color of that. Uh, and they're adding half a pound of that uh, into it as they make it. And that will give a little bit of a caramel flavor to the beer as well as a deeper color. When we take a look at the hops they're using, this is using twice as much hops uh, in the boil as the, as the previous beer I showed you, the Bud Light clone. Uh, and they're using a couple of different varieties. It also adds hops late in the boil as well as some dry hops uh, in the fermenter to give more of a hop aroma and flavor to this beer. Let's try something else. Here in the Boston area, you probably have heard of Harpoon India Pale Ale. Um, and so again, this is someone else's idea of uh, a clone uh, for this. Uh, here, uh, this beer is uh, amber in color. It's fuller body. It has more hop bitterness and a piney aroma. Uh, and it has, uh, you know, you can see that uh, prediction of what you're going to get for the beer uh, from the calculator. A little bit more in alcohol, higher starting gravity around 1060. Uh, and it has, you know, a little over seven pounds worth of uh, grain, uh, grain or malt extract in this. Um, it has uh, some very dark grains added to it, like this American roasted barley. That, that's, that's about the darkest thing you can put in a beer. But they only put a little bit of it, only a tenth of a pound in this five-gallon batch. Uh, to give more of that uh, dark uh, amber color. And then for hops, this is much hoppier than the other beers. It has, this one has twice again as much hops in the boil as the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. So it, it stepped up the amount of hops uh, in there uh, and how long they're boiled. Uh, and then it has, again, twice as much uh, hops late in the boil and, and at, uh, at uh, 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 fermentation uh, time uh, uh, to give it a bigger aroma and flavor to it. All right, now for something completely different. 
in the, in the immortal words of Monty Python. Um, uh, this is a, a stout, uh, an oatmeal stout, uh, again, made low, uh, uh, you know, an attempt at a clone for a beer that's made locally here in, in, the, in the New England area. And this one uh, is a very black brown colored beer. It's very full bodied, has a little bit of hop bitterness uh, and spicy aroma, but it has uh, some maltiness to it. This one's even higher uh, uh, starting gravity and higher alcohol than the other beers that we've talked about. Um, uh, and and you know, has more like nine pounds uh, worth of uh, malt extract, sugars and grains added to it. Uh, when it comes to specialty grains, uh, it, instead of just adding a little bit of very dark grains, it adds a lot of very dark grains, right? It's adding, you know, uh, lots of different types of these uh, black patent, uh, uh, a very, very dark uh, uh, charred uh, looking uh, malt, uh, as well as a bunch of the uh, caramel and chocolate malts, which will also give some nice chocolatey uh, taste to it. The other interesting thing is it adds uh, flaked oats uh, for a bit of a chewier mouthfeel and uh, more opacity. So it'll be less translucent. Uh, you won't be able to see as much light through it. Uh, and that's because uh, of, of, the, uh, of the oatmeal that's added to it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea about how brewing recipes work. And it's a lot of fun to play around with these things. Uh, what's cool about some of these uh, 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 recipe uh, tools that are online, you know, they've got a pretty good database that you can take a look at, um, see how many people have used them, uh, you know, what some of the reviews are of that, uh, and then, you know, use that to help you formulate your own brewing recipe. Or you could go to books and use those, or you could buy kits online uh, from, a, from a brew supply place and, and make what they have. It all works. If it tastes good to you, you did the right thing. So let's just review the brewing process again. Um, this picture I showed you before. Um, what I'm going to do is show you a, a sort of a virtual brew day at my place. Uh, and uh, in graphical form. And you're gonna get one chart uh, on the brewing process and then two charts that are related to the cellaring process, which takes a longer period of time. So there's a lot going on here, right? And when we start at the left-hand side of this, we're starting with water, grains, and hops. And, and, and by the we're time on the right-hand side, we're, we're at, at work. And so you start off with the specialty malts and, and or flake grains. You put them basically in a big tea bag, except this is a muslin bag. You steep uh, uh, half of the water that you want to use. Instead of, you're going to make a five gallon bag. So you're going to do two and a half gallons of water. You're going to steep those grains in, at 165 degrees Fahrenheit in a pot on the stove for about 20 minutes. Get a nice thermometer, stick it in there, make sure it stays that temperature. You can adjust the burner to, uh, as you need to to get, get it uh, stable at that temperature. And then what you're going to do is you're going to get uh, a, a, about a half gallon of water, and you're going to heat that, have heated that on the side uh, up to about 170 degrees. And you're going to pour that over the muslin bag. And what that's going to do is rinse a lot of the great stuff out of the grains uh, and into your pot, which is what you want. And then you're going to pour all that uh, into a kettle. I use a 10 gallon kettle for a five gallon batch. That's because I like a lot of headspace. And uh, you might think that's a lot of headspace, man. I'll show you some pictures of why, <laughs> why, why I like having that much headspace. Um, and uh, what I, the brew kettle I use is really cool. Um, you know, it costs about 300 bucks to buy, uh, uh, but what's nice about it, it has a built in level on the side uh, and a thermometer and a spout. So you can open it up and, and pour beer out of it. You can attach a hose to it makes it a snap to clean up. It makes it really easy to work with when you're brewing uh, and avoid spills and all that sort of thing. Can you imagine picking up five gallons of, you know, hot, hot liquid and pouring it into a different pot that's that, that prone, prone to problems? I've done it. Uh, I've made all those mistakes. So I've tried to optimize and just, you know, get a good piece of equipment where you don't have to mess with that. Um, into the, into the uh, uh, work that you got from the uh, grains, you're going to add your malt extract and you're going to stir that in with a good spoon or, or beer paddle. Um, I use a stainless steel paddle that's nice and strong so I can stir it in vigorously uh, into the work. Um, you're going to have that sitting on the base of a, a propane uh, burner or your stove, whatever you want, uh, but I brew outside with a propane burner. Uh, and then you ignite that burner and you heat up the wort until it boils. And you're going to boil it vigorously for 60 minutes. And I have some nice video here that Anthony's going to help me show right now. Uh, 
All right. So um, I, there's this thing uh, called the hot break, and that's this foamy stuff that's risen up to the top of the beer as it's boiling. That's why I like to have a lot of headspace. Um, and you can see uh, this will rise up very quickly the closer you get to boiling. So it's good to have a, ther a thermometer in there and, and measure it uh, and not be away from the beer for any reason when you're getting close to boiling because that hot break will rise up. And if you don't throttle back on the burner, it'll boil over. You'll have a hot sticky mess. You'll lose a lot of your beer. That's not good. Uh, but if you throttle it properly, what will happen is uh, you'll wait until that hot break eventually uh, starts to break down and boil back into the beer. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, back to the diagram uh, here, uh, uh, what you'll do is at, at various time uh, intervals, uh, based on the recipe that you're making, you will add the different hops and stir them in. Uh, and I'll show you, and when you do that, uh, while, uh, while you're still boiling, um, you can actually get another mini hot break uh, out of this. So you have to be careful. And again, I will have uh, Anthony show another picture, of, uh, another video of this. So now it's now I'm ready to add the hops and, and we'll, you know, that's what the hop pellets look like. All right. You can see the beer boiling. And you pour them in. The remainder of the hot old hot break is there. Pour pour the pour the hops in, and immediately you start to see it turn green, kind of like the Incredible Hulk. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, you'll see that get very foamy. Uh, and uh, as you stir that in, and then uh, you know, it will also get foamy and rise up a little bit. So you have to be watching the the the, the burner th uh, throttle there a little bit uh, and adjust that so that you don't boil over again. And then eventually that just breaks up uh, and boils down into the beer. Okay, great. So at the end of your 60 minutes of boiling, your you know your 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 wort is ready to be uh, transferred uh, into a fermenter uh, and then yeast added to it, so it'll turn into beer. Okay, so uh, you know, in the industrial process, they have a big heat exchanger. Uh, for this, uh, uh, real I quick, actually, Jeff, you, you'll want to reshare your screen. Oh, I have to reshare. Okay, yep. great. Great. Can you all see this? Excellent. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so. Uh, 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 what I have here for a heat exchanger is uh, they sell them in copper, but I like to use stainless steel. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, called a work chiller. It's really just stainless steel tubing uh, with two uh, hose attachments to it. Um, and so uh, you can see what I've done is I've hooked up my two different garden hoses. One's connected to the you know the cold water uh, faucet on the outside of my house or or wherever uh, you could buy an adapter. So if you're doing it inside your house, you could connect it to the, your kitchen sink. Uh, and then the idea is the cold water comes in, circles around this uh, wort chiller, uh, and then you know the hot water uh, as it exchanges the heat out of the the, the wort uh, comes out of the uh, exhaust uh, uh, hose. Um, you know uh, the objective here is you know for if you're making an ale yeast, uh, using an ale yeast to make an ale, uh, you want to get down to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're going from boiling all the way to 75. Uh, degrees uh, as quickly as you can. Uh, and as for five gallons, this typically takes about uh, 10 to 40 minutes. The big variables are air temperature and uh, tap water temperature, uh, depending on where it's coming out. Um, so certain times of the year, you know, wintertime, the water will be colder than it is in summertime. If you live in a tall building and it goes through a lot of internal pipes, it won't be as cold as if you were getting it uh, somewhere out uh, in the suburbs straight out of the ground. Um, uh, you, once that's cooled down, uh, you can use the handy spigot and a hose that you attach to the bottom. You just pull this up and set it up on a countertop or a table and you uh, then just open up uh, the, the uh, spigot on it and gravity feed it down into uh, what's called a carboy or fermenter. Um, uh, some people like to use plastic ones, some people use, like to use glass ones, some people like to use stainless steel. I go with uh, stainless steel or glass. Um, and the nice uh, attractive feature to the glass is that you can kind of see it. Um, so uh, when you do that, uh, you want to keep air 
out of your work uh, because you're you've at you know you you want to keep it uh, uh, clean uh, without any other microbes than your yeast getting in there. So you put one on that has an airlock, and there's a lot of different styles of airlock. Uh, it allows the CO2 as your beer ferments to escape without letting more air uh, get back into it. But before you're ready to really put the lid on it, uh, you want to take a uh, you use your hydrometer and to make a, an original gravity reading. And for the beer I was making this day, the original gravity was 1074. Uh, then you open and pitch in your yeast. And so I use two packets of yeast for this one rather than making a yeast starter. Uh, and then put on your airlock and stand back and watch your beer ferment. Um, the picture uh, uh, here in the center was taken after about 24 hours after I put the yeast in. So when you first put the yeast in, it looks like this first picture. Uh, to the left of the yeast, and then uh, after 24 hours, you start to see this uh, sort of foamy white stuff on the top of, of, of the beer. After 37 uh, hours, uh, it's uh, gotten a little thicker, and there's some sort of uh, muddy colored stuff uh, on top. That's actually um, some of the yeast that's doing its top fermenting. Um, so you can see that, uh, and some of the, the uh, cells uh, from the yeast uh, there. Uh, and then after 47 hours, you get this big pillowy stuff at the top um, uh, with, uh, uh, that's very foamy. Uh, and there's a brewer's technical name for that, and that's called Kreuzen. It's a German word. Um, so I have it phonetically spelled as well as, uh, uh, you know, spelled the way you would spell it in German. Um, I will note that uh, at high Kreuzen, uh, which is the peak of fermentation, that billowy stuff can get very big, almost like the hot break when you're boiling the beer. Um, and so uh, that's why I like to have a lot of headroom in my fermenter. So for a five to five and a half gallon batch of beer, I use a seven gallon fermenter. Um, you know, uh, I'll show you a picture of what happens later on <laughs> when you don't have enough headspace. It's pretty funny and messy. Um, so the idea here is, is that you're gonna ferment your beer uh, in this fermenter called the primary fermentation for about seven to 12 days. Then after that, you're gonna siphon the beer out of that. You're just gonna use a plastic uh, tube uh, and again, gravity feed it. You'll take the fermenter that has the beer in it at the top and, and uh, another container, uh, uh, either a transfer pot uh, or another fermenter at the bottom and you'll just siphon it out of there. Uh, you'll make sure that that's all, all that stuff is nice and clean. Um, you can siphon the beer back into the fermenter once you've uh, cleaned the original one out. And the reason why is you're cleaning out all this gunk from the yeast and all the deposits that come into the bottom of it. Then you, uh, uh, again, once it's back in the fermenter, you leave it there another 10 to 14 days and you can start to measure that around 10 days in that secondary fermenter uh, to start to see where the, where the gravity is to say, is that about where you want to stop fermentation or is it sort of stopping on its own? And for this beer, uh, I measured it, you know, uh, after, uh, you know, uh, 10 days or so, it was down to 1020 finishing gravity. And I said, great, that's a 7.1% alcohol beer. That's what I wanted. That's what my recipe was supposed to do, I'm done. All right. And then again, uh, it's time to package it. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about bottling. Um, I used to bottle, it's a lot of fun. You can read about how to do it. Um, for, for me, I really like the quality of the beer uh, uh, that you get out of kegging. Um, and kegging is uh, relatively low cost. Uh, I have a small refrigerator uh, with tap handles in it uh, and a, a carbon dioxide gas supply. Uh, and this thing in the, the bottom of the floor here is, is an example of a, of a five and a half gallon keg. So I just siphon the beer into that keg. Uh, and what's on that uh, keg is a CO2 input valve and a beer output valve. Uh, that when you hook it up to your uh, kegerator uh, and gas supply uh, will allow the CO2 to push the beer out through the beer output valve. Um, for the IPAs that I make, particularly the, uh, the New England style IPAs, I take hop pellets and put them in a, hop, a stainless steel hop sleeve. So this is almost like uh, the uh, hop equivalent of like a tea cozy. Uh, and um, uh, I drop it down uh, into uh, the keg. Um, and it won't interfere with uh, the ability of uh, the beer to come out of the, the keg because it's drawn off of the bottom from a long tube. So this will just sort of float in the beer uh, as uh, once you seal it all back up. I show a couple of examples of uh, packaging for uh, hops and uh, these cryo hops 
are really popular right now if you make New England style IPAs or, or West Coast IPAs. They do a great job of imparting uh, hop aromas, but they're not cheap. Um, six ounces of them cost $42. So imagine, I told you my beer, this beer I'm making costs $95. 42 of the cost is six ounces of hops. The other stuff is pretty cheap. So if you use a different type of hop that's lower cost, uh, you'll have a cheaper beer to make. Uh, and then once, it, again, uh, once the uh, keg is pressurized uh, and you've uh, pumped it uh, with CO2 uh, and let it cool down for a few days, uh, it's basically ready to serve. Uh, and so uh, that's just a picture of uh, what my uh, kegerator setup looks like at home. Tasting and enjoying your beer is really important. Um, I gave this talk at work originally, so this is a couple of my colleagues in my research group. Uh, we we, we uh, go off site to, to do a little bit of strategic thinking every now and then about our research group. So this is us uh, enjoying uh, some beers at Trillium in these uh, interesting uh, tulip glasses. Um, so there's lots of different types of glasses out there for a different type of beer or beer styles. Um, you know, don't, don't go too crazy, uh, but I do find that one to three different types of glass uh, do tend to work better for some styles than others, or at least that I prefer them. But, um, you know, because the shape of the glass can actually affect how you perceive the aroma uh, of the beer as you uh, drink it. So if you want to find out more about that, there's a lot of uh, good resources uh, to check that out online. Uh, as far as beer styles themselves, uh, I mentioned that I had been a beer judge and, and learned about that. There are really cool style guides out, out there for beer judging uh, on the internet, and uh, you can get pretty into it if you want to. Um, for an example of uh, another tool that some people like to use are things called uh, uh, flavor wheels. Um, if you drink wine, there are versions of these things for wine, et cetera. There's a lot of different ones for beer. Um, this particular one I kind of like. It's from this guy, Mark Dredge's uh, uh, book, uh, that have uh, sort of attributes of aroma and flavor sort of up in the upper uh, right hand side of this that come from uh, hops uh, and different uh, air regions in which those hops are grown with different uh, in the outer wheel, different uh, components of those uh, flavors. Uh, and then you can see on the upper left hand side the malt uh, components. And what's kind of interesting is bitterness or your, your perception of bitterness uh, could either be coming from hops if it has sort of uh, pithy, botanic, uh, peppery, earthy tastes, uh, or it could be coming from, from the malts if it has sort of more of a coffee or roasted or licorice uh, taste to it. So speaking of selecting glasses that work for your beer, we had a question yeah. about um, purchasing brew kettles like yours, a Blickman. Yep. Seth Trotz asks, um, do you need to decide up front if you ever want to do whole grain brewing or is that something that you can change later on um, that yeah, you don't you have to worry about? Yeah you, yeah, you can totally change that later on. If you want to do all grain brewing, you'll need a brew kettle, uh, but you'll also need uh, something called a, a mash ton uh, that you would do the, the mashing in. Um, and I will back up briefly to show you um, that in this picture. Um, in a mash tun, uh, this uh, thing has a false bottom. It typically has a suspended bottom, so the grains are in it. Uh, and then there's a perforated uh, 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 bottom to it so that the grains stay on the top and the water and uh, the liquid rather can be extracted through the bottom. Um, and, uh, and typically uh, what people will do uh, to, to pro properly mash their beer um, instead of doing that muslin bag thing where you just pour other hot water on it, um, what you want when you're doing all grain, you really want to get an even distribution of water uh, across the grain bed so that it really uh, slowly seeps down through all those grains and rinses out all the good uh, ingredients out of them. And you want to do that slowly. So, um, uh, you know, you, you really need to invest in another pot. Uh, uh, buy an insert that allows it to have a false bottom in it uh, and put, uh, uh, put the grains in there. I do know some people that uh, don't actually use a pot at all. They uh, use a big, one of those big rectangular Coleman uh, style uh, coolers uh, that has the spigot at the bottom and then they put a special stainless steel sleeve over the spigot so none of the grains go down the spigot and get stuck in it. Uh, and they actually um, uh, mash uh, their grains uh, in that. So either one, either one works. I've done both kinds. They're, they're great. You would want a second vessel for that. 
And do you have a recommendation uh, for uh, models for all grain brewing? Uh, one of our listeners has been brewing for the last few months, but on a borrowed system. Do you have a specific system you use for all grain brewing? Uh, I don't. I have. I have a. I have a basically an old five-gallon brew pot that's got uh, that I went online and bought a false bottom uh, for. It's, it's just a perforated plate. Um, and uh, just uh, it has a couple of holes in it where you uh, uh, can just uh, adjust uh, some screws uh, and bolts, a little, you know, sort of like little standoffs at the bottom. Uh, and the, the pot I use on that one also has a spigot uh, at the bottom so that I can uh, easily, um, uh, you know, just open the spigot, the, water, the liquid will run out, uh, and then I can slowly sparge and, and sprinkle water on with, a, with a, just a, you know, standard kitchen, you know, pitcher. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some people have asked me in the past, like, hey, Jeff, you know, it looks like you've got some stuff that's kind of large. You know, I live in an apartment. Can I do this on my kitchen? You know, that's, that's the way I used to do it. Um, I would say the only reason why I've gone to sort of the larger brew pots is I, I want to do full boils because I think it results in uh, better tasting beer. Uh, and uh, I, I like to have that headspace so I don't have to worry about boil overs. Uh, and I do it outside so that if I do, I just get a garden hose and I rinse it off. Um, it makes my wife a lot happier. Um, so, uh, but that said, you know, there are a lot of things you can do uh, in an apartment uh, on a, on a stove, uh, stove top setup. Um, you know, you just either, uh, you just modify what you do. You either make a, you know, you don't make five gallons of beer, you make less, in which case you don't have a headspace problem. Or you get clever, if, if you have a fairly large stove, you, you put it in two pots and you boil two pots at the same time. Uh, because at the end, when you cool them down, you can just put them all in the same fermenter. So you know, either one works. Um, so here's uh, uh, the sort of the, the, what I think are some of the most important things that have improved my, the quality of the beer I've, I've been able to make. Um, so first of all, just use you know, common sense when you're looking uh, at, at home brewing. Um, you don't really need complicated recipes to make great tasting beer. In some cases, it's actually almost the opposite. The simpler the recipe, the better the beer will be, uh, as long as you have a good process. And so uh, that gets into this fully boiling piece. Your commercial brewers don't, it, well, so why, why do I make a big deal about full boil? A lot of places when you buy a, a kit online will ship you this nice little box and they'll say, and here's everything you need. Here's a list of instructions. And, and because they figure you don't have a wart chiller, or the ability to cool the beer down very quickly, uh, what they will say is, you know, uh, brew basically half the beer, and then just have a big bucket of water for the rest of the volume of the beer you want, and then you, and and have that be very cold, and then pour pour the hot part of the beer into this water, and that'll help cool it down a lot. The problem is you're not actually boiling all the liquid. That's that's not good. Um, and uh, I feel like uh, I get better quality product by, by fully boiling. But if you do, you're going to want to chill it rapidly because the longer you leave beer hot and exposed to the air, the more chance you have for microorganisms that have bad tastes and other things like that to get in there. So the wart chiller is really important uh, for being able to do that and to do that quickly. It's also great from a time-saving perspective. Uh, making a yeast starter in advance or buying two packets of liquid yeast to make uh, 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 an initial uh, fermentation is great for getting your yeast colony nice and healthy and strong. So it munches up all that beer and turns it into uh, wort and, and sugar and turns it into alcohol uh, before bacteria and other nasty things can do, do that instead. Um, use stainless steel for everything you can uh, and, for, and glass for the things that you can't. Do not use plastic. I do not like plastic. You, you probably after about five brew, brews, the plastic is going to forever be contaminated with all that stuff, uh, and it's hard to get clean. Um, so, uh, and then leave plenty of headroom. And then kegging is a lot easier than bottling, in my opinion, and can yield a more consistent results than bottling. Uh, plus, you can just instead of having a, a whole bottle of beer or a whole can of beer, you can just have a little bit. Uh, uh, whenever you want. And then the other cool thing is you can dry hop directly uh, into the keg for some really awesome IPAs rather than throwing all that out when you go from the fermenter uh, into the keg. It just stays there with the beer. Uh, so you always have that awesome awesomeness. And that's a picture of why you want to leave plenty of headroom in the fermenter. <laughs> that's a sort of a slow motion explosion that you just continually have to 
scrape off until uh, high croissant is over and it sort of dies back down. And that stuff is very sticky. So uh, thanks to all the brewers and beers I've known. Thanks for listening. Uh, Jeffrey, if you have time, we have uh, one more question from the chat from sure. Rob Ellert. Uh, is it better to leave the yeast on top of the wort or do you mix it in completely? Sure, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I definitely mix it in pretty well. The yeast, the, for ale yeast, that'll come to the top naturally. So yeah, you just take it in and you, you, you mix it in really good. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> We're just, we'll just see if we have any more questions. Sure. And while we're waiting for more questions, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been a great talk. Uh, wonderful for everybody to see. A lot of thank yous coming in. No more questions so far. <laughs> All right. Um, it was I'll, give really... you, I'll give you a bonus trivia round. So, oh, uh, <laughs> um, so the, the logos that you see, my uh, daughter, uh, Emma, who just graduated um, from Simmons University uh, with a communications degree and a, and a graphic design uh, background, um, designed them for me as a present. So. Uh, so they're in our portfolio online, so that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, while the Gottschalk Brewing Company is completely fictional, um, interestingly, there actually is a beer named Gottschalk, if you can believe it. But, you know, I have such a strange last name. Um, there's actually uh, an abbey in, in, uh, in the Czech Republic uh, that has a bunch of monks that decided to brew beer, and they named one of the beers after this abbot uh, from the Middle Ages or whatever uh that that had this last name so that uh check that's the sort of the check spelling of what my last name is that's fantastic oh goodness uh one last question that we see jeff what is your favorite beer to brew or simply to drink my favorite beer to brew is that double ipa i was showing you and and to drink it i just love it it's it's like that's the wonderful. perfect it's the perfect it's the perfect balance of easy to make and and delicious to drink. Well, fantastic. Thank you again for coming out and, and giving us this talk. This is really interesting, really entertaining, and really uh, informative. Um, any suggestions for a starter kit to somebody just getting started? Um, yeah, um, there's uh, two great uh, uh, places that I typically order mine from. Um, there's a, a place called Midwest Brewing Supplies um, and another place called uh, Northern Brewer. Uh, and they both have really um, uh, great kits. Um, the, the Midwest um, Brewing Supply had a really good sort of West Coast IPA uh, 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 kit that was uh, sort of a, a, a brewery sanctioned clone from a Chicago area, I think it was a Chicago area, a brewery called uh, Surly Brewing Company, and that was delicious. <laughs> absolutely delicious so if you go to midwest brewing look for the, whatever the surly ipa clone i think it's called furious or ferocious or something like that really really tasty well excellent thank you so much we're gonna end the talk here uh well we're gonna give you one last question before okay. we end the talk <laughs> are there any local places to pick up hops malts etc Sure. Um, uh, the, uh, it's gotten harder over the years. There used to be, I don't actually know if it's still there, down in Cambridge, uh, since many of you are, you know, are at MIT, there used to be a really cool place called uh, the Modern Brewer on Mass Ave. I have no idea if it's still there. Um, there's a place in Woburn um, that uh, has, has been there for years called uh, Beer and Wine Hobby, uh, but uh, uh, they've probably been there for Two or three decades and they also do mail order so you, you know you can order online and they'll deliver to you uh, or you can go into the store and pick it up um, they indicated the last time i was there sort of before all this covid stuff happened that they were moving um, to danvers in july so those are the ones that i know about i'm sure there are others Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, in case you missed any part of this talk, we will be posting it. So uh, look for that email in your inbox shortly, and we hope everybody has a fantastic day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.